I'm here to talk about learning to count. This may seem like an odd subject to you, but, but a larger goal of my trip has been to participate in a workshop that has string theorists and mathematicians. And so you can view this as uh, some elementary background for the string theorist participants in the conference. Uh, if they learn to count now, then they'll understand the number theorists tomorrow. So this picture I'll explain uh, by about two thirds through my talk. You're not supposed to know what it is uh, until then. Okay, so it turns out that some of the most basic questions in string theory, uh, even that enter in some of the applications that Gregory mentioned, uh, and also in, in other parts of mathematics and physics, just involve counting problems. So let me start with a very simple counting problem that does appear uh, in string theory. Uh, here's the number one, and if we wanna write one as a sum of, of other uh, positive integers, we can write it one way as, as one. Here's two. Well, if we wanna write that as a sum of, of other positive integers, we can write it as two or one plus one. So we can define a number, p of two, and say it's two, because you can write two in two different ways as sums of integers. For three, p of three is three, so now if you're a physicist, you try to prove inductively that P of n is n for all n. Uh, this is the first case I know where that fails, even though the first three examples worked, right? So at, at four, you find that in fact, there are five different ways to write four as, as partitions. Okay. So um, the goal of my talk, I'll talk very briefly about this, but it'll be to, to show that much richer examples of these kinds of structures um, emerge and help characterize the interaction of cutting edge theoretical physics, in this case, string theory, but there are other areas, uh, with mathematics. Okay, so the question I did start with there on my first slide is, is that of partition numbers? And my claim uh, is that that's not just a basic question in mathematics, which I hope you can see it is. It's one of the first things you might think about even as a child, um, but also a question in physics. So why is that? Well, one answer, it's not the first answer I would necessarily give, but it's the one relevant for my talk, uh, is that it appears in the physics of string theory. Okay, so what is string theory? I expect most of you have heard the elevator pitch on this before. So I'm gonna be kind of brief. It's a theory where we imagine that elementary particles, which are usually the basis of physical theories we write down, are replaced instead with, with tiny loops of string. The strings are, are very tensile objects. They, they, uh, they're, they're, they're tightly bound into little loops. And so uh, we don't see the particle nature. They show up as particles at long distance. But the different ways in which they might oscillate, here's the string in some oscillating shape, will show up as particles with different properties. So let's just consider the possible states of a single string that's oscillating in sort of one transverse dimension. Okay, well, the one thing a string can do, and here I've drawn it with an open string, a string with two ends, like the string on a violin, um, because that's easier to, to see, is it, it, can, it can oscillate, but with different wavelengths of oscillation. There could be a wave that has you know, one period when you go all the way across, or that has two, or that has three. Okay, these are different harmonics of the string. Now, in quantum mechanics, what happens is that each of these corresponds to a mode that can be excited one or two or three or four times. Okay, they're, the, they're quantized. So the quantum string with one of these modes shows up to a particle physicist as a particle with a mass that depends on the harmonic. The first one would weigh the mass of the string, the second one twice that, the third one three times that, and so on and so forth. Now, as I said, in quantum mechanics, it could be that you excite this lowest mode, the guy that just has one period as you go across, more than once. There could be two quanta present there, or three quanta, just like there could be two or three photons uh, of green light. And so there are integers, n1, n2, n3, that tell you how many of the fundamental you know, period versus uh, the thing that oscillates twice or three times as you go across the string are present. And then such a string state would have a mass given by, well, the number of the, the first excitation would, would weigh n1 times m string, and then there would be twice n2, because it costs twice as much energy when you excite one of those, three times n3, and so forth. So that would be the, the spectrum of possible particle states labeled by mass that you'd get out of oscillating strings. So it's natural to ask how many physical states exist at some fixed energy. Okay, in real string theory, we think M string is so high that we wouldn't see most of these states, but it's the natural physical question to ask. Physicists actually call that the partition function for not unrelated reasons. So the number of states at the nth level, well, we can see from the setup of the problem, you know, when you want these things to add up to N, you're trying to pick integers n1, n2, n3 
such that 1 times n1 plus 2 times n2 plus 3 times n3 add up to n. That problem should look familiar. It's the abstract statement of the problem I started with on my first slide. Okay, and so let me see if I can use this device. Right, so at the nth level, the number of string states that, that oscillate with that energy is precisely P of n, the nth partition number. And so the degeneracies of energy levels in string theory are controlled by these partitions. Now, this example isn't meant to be uh, a G whiz example. It's supposed to be very simple. Okay, it's a bit trivial for a physicist. It would seem like overkill that I'm using string theory here. This is really the physics of a collection of harmonic oscillators. It's the first thing they learn about uh, as undergrads. But we're going to see that the connection between string theory and natural counting problems continues as you go to more and more involved problems that show up in more advanced applications of string theory, although the questions get more and more elaborate, and so I'll only be able to explain a couple of them uh, during the course of my talk. So to motivate the deeper questions, I'll need to discuss a little bit more of the physics of string theory. So it's a fact that the theory naturally lives in higher dimensions. Nine plus one in some versions. Now, usually if somebody said in some versions, you'd think I was being a politician and waffling. Um, but that's not really what I'm trying to do here. The theory, like any promising theory that goes beyond what we already know, um, is a sufficient um, advance over current ways that we think about experimentally verified physics that the notion of dimension is an emergent one. Dimensions aren't built into the theory, they come out. And so it's actually true that it's just some versions of the theory that have nine plus one dimensions, and other versions have other numbers. But for the rest of this talk, we'll, we'll imagine nine plus one most of the time when we talk about string theory. Okay, now as a consequence, because physicists, even string theorists, are usually interested in physics in three plus one dimensions, three space, and the plus one is time, it's natural to consider compactified versions of the theory. Okay, versions where although the theory has more dimensions, if you have four plus n space-time dimensions, you imagine that n of them get curled up on some small space whose size is small enough that we don't see it today in present experiments. Okay, and that idea doesn't really originate with string theorists. It originated in the 1920s uh, in independent works of Kuza and Klein, who imagined that there was a fifth dimension uh, unseen by us, uh, and it was compactified on a circle. And the reasons they did this were not dissimilar uh, to the reasons that string theorists consider these extra-dimensional theories. Kaluza and Klein were after a unified theory of all of physics. Uh, in 1920, physics was faster to learn. There was just gravity and electromagnetism. And they were able to argue that a five-dimensional picture could, could offer a unified framework where both gravity and electromagnetism would emerge from a single force in five dimensions. Now, this higher-dimensional string theory has some important physical properties that I'm going to use as a crutch throughout this talk. Okay, first of all, it has a property that's called supersymmetry. So what does this mean? Well, sometime after they've learned about the harmonic oscillator, physicists learn that if you consider elementary particles, things like the electron and the photon, that we think we don't know that they're, they're made of substructures, um, they come in really two fundamentally different types. Okay, so there are many electrons. Your body has more than Avogadro's number of them in it, more than 10 to the 23, right? Um, but we think that any two electrons if you viewed them as individual particles, would be identical. Okay, they're like identical twins, but even better. And in particular, you could imagine switching them, and you might think all physics would be the same because those two electrons were really identical. Okay, now that's, it's not quite true. It turns out that it's true up to a sign. So if you have two electrons, in quantum mechanics, you assign to electrons a wave function that governs their probability distributions, and you can get signs between the states where you switch the two electrons. So particles where you get a negative sign when you switch to identical objects are called uh, fermions. Uh, and the others, the ones where you get the plus sign, which is more intuitive, are called bosons. And photons are examples of bosons. Electrons are examples of fermions. Supersymmetry is an odd theory that says that in nature, for every particle of one of these fundamental types, you should have one of the other. Okay. Now, I've used the electron and photon. Uh, unfortunately, they're not each other's partners uh, under this imagined symmetry. The electron would have to be partnered to another particle, creatively called the selectron, that we haven't yet seen. Uh, and for the photon, there would be various things, but you know, a photino, something like that. These superpartners aren't seen. I'm not going to talk about experiments at all in my talk. This is a mathematical symmetry that is present in the 10-dimensional theory, and I'm going to use it as a theoretical crutch. Because I'm talking in part to mathematicians, these kinds of crutches are totally reasonable. 
Okay, here's the second thing that's true of string theory in nine plus one dimensions. It gives rise at long distances, distances large compared to the size of a string, which is some tiny, tiny length scale, to a gravity theory. And it's not just any old gravity theory, it's Einstein gravity. Okay, so when you were in school, you were in Newton's law that if you have two particles of two masses, m1 and m2, then they'll attract each other with a force that's proportional to the product of their masses that falls off with an inverse square law. Um, and if you thought about it then, the way you're taught that force, they're attracting each other instantaneously. You move one, the force changes instantly. The inverse square is of a different distance. What Einstein taught us is that that Newton law is an emergent picture from a, in some sense, much more elegant framework where particles don't interact instantly with each other. They don't really interact with each other in that sense at all through gravity. Um, instead, what gravity is is the statement that energy or mass in space-time causes the space itself to curve or warp. Okay, so a picture you can imagine is that if you have a very heavy object, in this case maybe that thing, the central sphere could be the sun, it causes a distortion of the space around it. The standard example relativists like to use is that you could imagine a heavy ball on a rubber sheet. The, the sheet gets distorted by the weight of the ball, and then a small ball bearing rotating around it would sense the curvature of that rubber sheet and move a little bit differently. Okay, and in Einstein's picture, the motion of the Earth around the sun is governed by this kind of curvature of the sheet of space-time surrounding the sun. Okay, so matter tells space how to curve up, and curved space then tells other matter, like for instance the Earth, how to move. It moves in the shortest path it can in the resulting curved space. So Einstein gravity, together with supersymmetry, are consequences of the 10-dimensional string theory. They're not built in, they come out. Now, why am I telling you this stuff? Okay, um, the third thing you learn as an undergraduate rather quickly is that although physics is about nature, physicists are very rarely studying nature, okay? In fact, what they're usually studying are something that we call spherical cows, okay? So imagine you teach at a university in the Midwest and many of your students are farmers and you wanna tell them problems relevant to their parents' daily lives, you might wanna consider a cow as a massive object. But you know, really cow, real cows are pretty complicated. They have hair and they have colors and they have weird shapes. So you can use a cow as an example, but you'll say, let's consider a spherical cow of mass M and uniform density. Okay, so here's the spherical cow. All of the problems that I'm gonna talk about today are analogous in that I'll be using set settings that are very simplified. They strip away many complexities of the real problem. And that's where supersymmetry will enter in my discussions. Okay, so the spherical cow models of string compactification involve supersymmetry of the sort I just described that will be preserved even when we compactify. Uh, and they involve um, what I'm calling Ritchie flat spaces. What does that mean? That's a big word. It just means that, unlike in this picture, there will be no sources. Space-time might be curled up in some interesting way, but it's solving the equations of motion with no external source of energy or momentum added. It's the simplest possible setting you might imagine. We'll see that even in the simplest possible setting, we have to rely on really powerful results in mathematics that are implicit to get anywhere. So where does this lead us? If we wanna just focus on these spherical cows, supersymmetry, no sources of anything, basically as close as you can be to empty space, the compactifications that we need to study, the ways to get from nine plus one to three plus one dimensions in string theory, use a, a conjecture by Calabi that was proved to be true by Yao in the 70s, uh, when he was still at Stanford. And what he proved is that on every of a certain class of topological spaces, now called Calabi-Yao manifolds after the author of the conjecture and it's the man who proved it, um, you can find not just one solution of the Einstein equations, a Ritchie flat metric with supersymmetry, um, but a whole family of them. And we'll talk about these families soon. Okay. So the result of Yao's theorem, and it's, it's stated relatively precisely, at least for me, up there, um, is that the spherical cow models that string theorists want in this, in this setting of 10-dimensional string theory involve not a product of Minkowski space with a circle, which is what Kaluza and Klein studied, but instead a product of Minkowski space where above each point in Minkowski space, there is one of these calabi yau spaces. And the most complicated thing I could imagine is this. So this is a genus three Riemann surface. But anyway, it's supposed to be a six dimensional calabi yau space. Yeah, but I couldn't get it into this little box. <laughs> yeah. What am I, a visual designer? Okay. So in this talk, I'm gonna discuss counting problems that we've encountered that generalize this partition problem in some, in some moral sense uh, 
um, but that, that really just arise with these spherical cows. Okay, and the main interest is going to be the rich connections these counting problems then have to different parts of physics. One will be something called duality. One will be called gauge theory, which some of you might have heard about if you've ever studied the standard model. And then lastly, we'll come to solving Einstein's equations, which is also where we started. Okay, so now we're going to begin with the actual body of my talk. My first subject is going to be duality. Okay, so I should first explain what I mean by duality. You've all seen yin and yang. I have a more favorite version of the same notion, which is due to Wittgenstein, uh, which is the famous drabbit or duck rabbit. Okay, so here's a picture, which you can buy on t-shirts. Uh, if you look along the x-axis, you see a duck. If you look along the y-axis, you see a rabbit. Which of you is correct? Right, well, obviously, you're all correct. This can be either a duck or a rabbit. Depends how you interpret it. Both interpretations are equally good and equally bad. They make some aspects of the image manifest, and they obscure others. So duality is the generalization of that kind of statement, that there are two precisely correct things, but each makes a different piece of the picture manifest uh, to mathematical theories or to physics. Okay. Now, in string theory, some of the most interesting such dualities arise because strings see geometry in a different way than point particles do. And so it can be the case that one string theory is seeing geometry this way, and another string theory is seeing the geometry that way, and they better agree because they're looking at the same object. Okay, so you get a duality with two different equally good pictures of the physics. So to understand that, I'm going to start with the simplest example. Let's consider string compactification not on one of these complicated spaces of Calabi and Yao, but on a circle. Okay, so I told you strings can oscillate. We drew this picture of the weird oscillating string. Um, but beyond oscillating, the string has two other ways you might imagine giving it energy. Okay, so here we have uh, an extra dimension that's a, uh, a circle rolled up here. And, you know, there's one of these above each point in the space time, so it rolls up into a cylinder. Well, one thing you could do with a string is you could wind it around the circle. Just like you can wind a rubber band around your wrist. And if you do it many times, it gets more and more tight. It's more and more energy in the tension of the rubber band. You could wind a string once or twice or three times around that circle. That's called a winding mode. And there's a picture of such modes here, winding around the circle. The other thing you could do is just like a particle could have momentum, the string could have momentum in the direction of the circle. Right? It could be whizzing around the circle like so with some units of momentum. It could have velocity. Now, it's an old fact. From quantum mechanics, and there are different ways to say this, but one is from quantum mechanics and requiring wave functions to be single-valued, that the momentum of a particle going around a compact space like a circle can't be any old number. Like in, in, in our space, we think we can impart any velocity we want to a ball. But in these compact dimensions, the momentum is quantized in units of the inverse radius of the space. So it could be 1 over r, 2 over r, 3 over r, or also 0, but that's not a helpful number to put here. But it can't be pi over r. Now, on the other hand, in units of the string scale, you take your rubber band, you wind it around a circle, there's an energy which is proportional to the size of the circle you wound it around. Okay, so it could be r or 2r or 3r. For those of you who know dimensional analysis and are super worried that I'm comparing 1 over r to r, all the units are made up with the tension of a string, which I've set to 1. Okay. Now, if you stare at these for long enough, and you keep in mind this, this uh, paradigmatic picture of Wittgenstein's of the drabbit. You should notice that there's, there's sort of a, a change of point of view you could do here. Um, the set of energy levels exhibits an exchange symmetry where you simply say that r is exchanged with 1 over r in units of the tension of a string or the length of a string. Okay. So winding modes shown on the left on a big circle uh, are, are related to motion on a small circle. These have big energy, and the motion has a, a big energy because 1 over r is, small for a small is large for a small circle. Okay. So this, this simple picture leads to a true statement, which you could conjecture just based on the very flimsy evidence I gave you, which is that string theory on a circle of radius r is the same as string theory suitably interpreted on a circle of radius 1 over r. Okay. That's the, the first example of a duality, and it's very shocking unless you're used to thinking about extended objects. It will certainly not be true in just Einstein gravity. Okay. Now, you might think that this kind of bizarre fuzziness of the geometry 
could only happen with a very simple space like a circle, where numbers like 1 over r and r could appear precisely in some equation. Okay, um, you would be wrong, it's not so. So one of the most glorious lessons of string theory, repeated in many different ways over the last 25 years, has been that duality, far from being only instantiated in the simplest examples, seems to be true almost uh, universally. Okay. So let's consider now strings on a Calabi-Yau space, one of these complicated spaces I mentioned uh, that were conjectured to exist by Calabi and proved by Yau. Okay, so we're going to consider one such topology. Okay, just to make sure we're all on the same page, what's the topology? Uh, here at the bottom, I have a donut. And here I have somebody squishing the donut and squishing it more and squishing it more. And you can turn it into a coffee cup. So topology is the property of the donut that it's invariant under smooth deformations, but that doesn't let you tear it, okay, or put a hole all the way through it. So uh, in the language of topology, this coffee cup and this donut would have the same topology. But Yao's theorem says that given such a topology, see, Einstein actually cares about notions of distance. He cares about a curved space-time and notions of distance between planets or other things. So you ha actually have to put a notion of distance into your topology. Uh, which means you need to specify more data to get a solution of Einstein's equations. And what Yao's theorem really says is fixing a topology, you get many solutions of Einstein's equation by deforming the shape of the space that solves the Einstein equation. Here I've shown a, a shape deformation of your donut. Or by deforming the size. Here we have a small donut, here we have a big donut. Einstein's theory sees them differently. So our spaces, our calabi yau spaces, come with parameters that can control their shape or their size. And for any fixed topology, you get these possible spaces of solutions, many, many, many solutions that differ in their shape or their size or both. Now, physicists or mathematicians talk about the moduli space of complex structures, meaning the space of shapes, or the moduli space of Kähler structures, meaning the space of possible sizes of one of these calabi Okay, What you should imagine in the circular case is the set of possible sizes is there's a radius of the circle. It could be big, it could be small. You can interpolate, so there's a parameter there. And for the shape, you should imagine that you, know, you could take the circle and, and crinkle it up so it looks more like a little line segment. Okay, you're, you're doing something to its shape, but preserving maybe the total circumference. So these are two spaces that are naturally associated with the problem. Now, these parameters show up in physics. Uh, if you don't like this slide, you can put it on the back burner in your mind and try to figure out what it means later. But to a 4D physicist who doesn't know that secretly above each point in space-time there are these complicated extra dimensions, these parameters that tell you you could have different solutions of your equations show up as expectation values of scalar fields. Okay, now what's a scalar field? I mentioned that there are bosons and fermions. A scalar field is the analog uh, of an electric field, but for a boson field that spin zero instead of spin one, which the photon has. So the photon gives rise to a field, the electric field. For every scalar field, there's a similar field, but instead of giving a vector at each point in space time, pointing in some direction like the electric field, it just gives one number. And five or six years ago, these were in the news all over the place because the Higgs boson was discovered at CERN. That was the first scalar field that fundamental physics had uncovered in nature. They, they're ubiquitous in condensed matter experiments, and I, I say the word fundamental in quotes for all kinds of reasons, but anyway. The Higgs is a good example of such a scalar field. And uh, given such a scalar phi that associates a number to each point in space, you could imagine a potential V of phi, like a hill. Here's a picture of the Higgs potential. So to each of these deformations of the shape or size of the extra dimensions is associated such a scalar field. And because you get a solution of the equations for each value, those deformations correspond to scalars that have flat potentials, like the bottom of the rim of this Mexican hat. Okay. So for each value of phi, you would get a different solution by moving it around the circle. Uh, similarly, for each value of the shape or size oops, of our extra dimensions, you get a different solution of the equations. So these fields appear in the 4D physics in a variety of ways in these spherical cows. But the most important is that they control values of coupling constants that determine the strength of low energy interactions. Okay, what do I mean? Well, in nature, there's an electromagnetic field. Electrons interact electromagnetically. They're both charged, and they have a Coulomb repulsion, which is also an inverse square law. Right? It goes like the product of the charges divided by R squared. The number that goes in front of that, the fine structure constant, which in nature is 1 over 137, uh, is something that's 
you know, it's a parameter. It determines the strength of the interactions. And it turns out in these spherical cow toy models, it's not a fixed number. It depends on the shape and the size of the extra dimensions. And so the details of the extra dimensions determine things like the fine structure constant in these toy models. Okay, so here's a picture of some Feynman graphs that you may or may not have seen before that control electron interactions in QED, Feynman's theory of electromagnetism. Now, here's an important piece of this story that will get us back to counting problems. There are different versions of 10-dimensional string theory. It doesn't matter too much for us what the detailed differences are. We'll call them 2a and 2b. But in one of these, the couplings, the analog of the fine structure constant in QED, are controlled by the size of the extra dimensions. And in the other, they're controlled by the shape of the extra dimensions. And in these two pictures, the nature of the relationship is such that in this A picture, quantum corrections exist. So your, your coupling constants are controlled by size, but in a complicated way that's very hard to compute. And in this other picture, your coupling constants, like alpha, are controlled by the shape. The fine structure constant would be controlled by the shape. But a crude result, the classical result, the first thing you would compute is exact. Now, you know, it sounds like what you should do is you work out this case yourself and you assign this result to your graduate students, right? And they can compute the corrections and, and we can all be happy. It turns out that that's too hard. The quantum corrections, when they exist, are horrendous to calculate. Okay, it's, I had a hard time finding a picture of this, but here's roughly the nature of the problem you get. We have the extra dimensions represented here by this gray circle. And the quantum corrections correspond to counting little, little submanifolds or subspaces inside the, the space of the extra dimensions. They correspond to counting spheres of minimal area embedded in this Calabi-Yau manifold. This is a problem in a, an area of mathematics called enumerative algebraic geometry. This area itself has a long storied history of you know, counting circles tangent to other circles and things like this going back to the Greeks. But a modern avatar of it would be take one of these famous spaces of Calabi and it, yeah, I want to ask how many minimal, minimal area x live in it, where x is your favorite kind of object. In simple cases, spheres are labeled by an integer that roughly determines their area. They can have area one or two or three or four and that integer determines their area. And in one very simple example of this kind of problem, Okay, a mathematician had a graduate student, and that student worked for years, and they made it up to degree two. So at degree one, there were 2,875 holomorphic spheres. At degree two, there were 609,250. Sorry. It took him all the way through his PhD, and he became a postdoc. <laughs> okay, sorry, I should say, a lot of what I'll say in the audience, many, many of the contributors are here. So this is pretty heroic, like 609,000, that's a lot of spheres to count. It probably took several nights of work, right? <laughs> now, here we have a quote from Weibniz. You, you could imagine that, you know, so then Sheldon has his own graduate student, he's like, compute degree three, okay? But, <laughs> but there's this quote from Weibniz. The universe that God chose to exist is the best of all possible worlds. And no student who's given the degree three case in a, in, a, in a problem where degree two resulted in counting 609,000 objects thinks that in the best of all possible worlds they count more than that, right? So what turns out to be the truth is that actually Leibniz for this problem is right. There is a clever way to solve the problem that doesn't involve any direct counting. It turns out that Calabi-Yau manifolds of the sort I've been describing come in pairs. We had a theory, which I called 2A, where computing numbers of embedded spheres, controlled quantum corrections to coupling constants, and you could compactify it on a Calabi-Yau manifold and put your graduate students to work. We had a theory called 2B where you could put it on a Calabi-Yau manifold and do a few lines, it's harder than that, but comparatively speaking, a few lines of computation and get a classical answer and be completely happy. And it turns out these spaces come in pairs such that there's a duality. 2A on one space is the same as 2B on the other space. For every X, there's a Y. And Leibniz's quote is certainly true in this picture on y, even if it was not true on x. So the way to solve the problem of counting the number of spheres immersed in some Calabi-Yau space x, this enumerative algebraic geometry problem, is to solve a completely different problem on a completely different space. Okay? You should think of this as the analog of the t-dual circle, but these spaces are so complicated that they have even different topology. So the result of this, 
uh, first appearing in work of Candela Steele, Asa Green, and Parks many years ago, uh, was a table where they here went up to degree 10. Here are the numbers. These first two you see agree with the work of Sheldon. Uh, and then they get rapidly much larger. This would take many, many vats of coffee to compute this number down at the bottom, right? But um, in fact, you could keep going and the list goes forever and we have integers for each number. Okay. So this resulted in a very striking and now verified set of mathematical predictions for counting problems that came out of string theory. In fact, the subject of mirror symmetry and understanding how you go from a, a space where you want to solve this complicated counting problem, how many spheres are immersed there, to its partner where you want to solve a trivial problem, remains a very fruitful and active area of research. And because I'm giving this talk at the Simons Foundation, here's a quote from the Simons Foundation website about one of their collaborations that they support called the Homological Mirror Symmetry Collaboration that studies precisely uh, the deep mathematical con connections between previously disparate mathematical disciplines that continue to come out of this kind of relationship. Okay, so that was a subject. I have 29 minutes left, so I can't possibly be done. So now I'm gonna change to a different subject, but you should suspect that it will probably be related to the first one too, or this is a really horrible talk, <laughs> okay? So now I'm gonna talk about gauge theory, which is naively distinct. So I've promised that you were taught many things in high school. Here's one that I think you probably were, Coulomb's Law. It says given charges Q1 and Q2, uh, then in some units, the force between them is some constant times Q1, Q2 over R squared. And in some way of talking about it, the previous section in my talk was how do you compute that constant? Now what we don't learn then is that calling that a coupling constant is a huge lie. It's not constant, okay? Uh, in quantum mechanics, what can happen is that between these two charges, there could be a quantum fluctuation, an electron and a positron could pop out of the vacuum, go between them. And if Q1 is negatively charged and Q2 is positively charged, then that fluctuation might have a positron that goes a little bit closer to Q1 and an electron that goes a little bit closer to Q2 before annihilating. And that will slightly screen the charges Q1 and Q2 because it'll hide them behind a charge of the opposite sign. The result is that the QED coupling, this coupling constant, the fine structure constant, gets weaker at long distances where we do experiments. And here I found some fine Russians had plotted a, uh, a plot of how alpha, this fine structure constant, runs with distance between the charges you're using to probe it. A very long distance where we do most of our experiments, the answer is one over 137, but not exactly, although there has been bizarre num numerology trying to explain that number by really great physicists like Eddington. Okay, this is not exactly correct. And then as you go to shorter distances, things change. So at Slack in the 1990s, when they were sitting on you know, a high energy pole caused between scattering two very high energy particles, uh, 90 GeV particles, they measured the value of alpha, it was one over 128. And if you continue to do those experiments to higher and higher energy, you get bigger and bigger constants as you get through the cloud of quantum fluctuations screening the charge. Okay. Now in this case, this just makes our life easier. We do experiments at long distance, the interaction gets weaker at long distance. We like weak interactions because it means things are basically free. They're not interacting at all, and then we can estimate everything we'd like. Things are moving and not interacting with each other. It's like a bunch of mathematicians in a room. <laughs> now, unfortunately, nature also contains strong interactions, or maybe fortunately, because we wouldn't be here without them, but anyway, uh, they're nuclear forces. So here's a picture of, uh, I guess, the nucleus. So outside in the sort of Bohr planetary orbit model of an atom is orbiting electrons, and inside there are a bunch of protons and neutrons, and the proton charge neutralizes the orbiting electrons. But what's holding all those protons and neutrons together in a nucleus, which is many orders of magnitude smaller than the whole atom, than the, the cloud of the electron wave function, uh, is a strong force, which is coincidentally called the strong force. Now, the powerful accelerators that we've built with taxpayer dollars over the past decades uh, have acted as microscopes that let us see into this structure and really verify that it's there and, and poke into it. Okay, so at long distances, meaning 10 to the minus eight centimeters, you have atoms. Okay. Shorter distances, about 10 to the minus 12 or 13 centimeters, you have nuclei. But if you probe into the nucleus, it's made of protons and neutrons. <coughs> and even smaller, a substructure of the proton and neutron are something called quarks. 
we don't know how big quarks are. We know that there's a limit, which is something like this. And defining exactly what you mean by the quark size is a very subtle problem because of the strong interactions. Now, something interesting happens here. Okay, I've drawn a plot of the strong interaction measured against roughly distance. But if you look at the plot, it's a little bit different than my previous one. Okay, here's a curve going down. Here was electromagnetism. Here was a curve going down. What's different? What's different is that the place that size appears is inverted. So this is the strong interaction at long distance. This is the strong, strong interaction at short distance. And so at long distances where we do experiments, the strong interactions are really strong. There's anti-screening of the strong force. And free quarks are, in fact, never seen. They're bound together by this strong anti-screening at long distance. Okay, instead, quarks are confined. Now, I could have put here a picture of confinement, but instead I put a bag of money. And this bag of money is here to remind you that there's a million dollar clay problem out. The Clay Math Institute offered a million dollars to somebody who proves to the level of satisfaction of everyone in this room that quarks are confined in QCD. Now, both the strong interactions uh, and electromagnetism are described by a class of theories known as gauge theories. Uh, in the case of electromagnetism, there's a photon. That's an example of something physicists call a gauge shield more generally. In the case of the strong interactions, there are eight analogs of the photon. Their nature is different. They interact with each other strongly. They screen, they anti-screen the strong force. But in any case, um, it's a theory of gauge fields. Now, the examples like the strong force with interaction strength that grows at long distance have been too hard for us to solve, hence the million dollar clay problem. Okay, but by adding supersymmetry, so here's our spherical cow again, we can imagine spherical cow examples of such gauge theories and ask, okay, we're gonna go back to our physics undergraduate edu education. We never solve the real problem. We first find a spherical cow, then we solve that. So can we find spherical cows that we can solve? So now I need to put in some lawyerly prose. Okay, what do we mean by solve? Okay, so let me try to explain what we mean by solve in this context. Just like our Calabi-Yau spaces didn't give a unique solution of the equations of motion, they came with parameters, they come with a size and a shape. These supersymmetric gauge theories don't come with, with a unique vacuum. They come with parameters that parameterize different possibilities for the vacuum state of the theory. This is because the analog of the photon in these spherical cows has a scalar partner. And that scalar can take different values along this, what physicists would call a moduli space of vacua. So what you should imagine is there's a plane a complex plane, and for each point on the yellow plane, there's a different theory. Okay, each of these is an example of a supersymmetric gauge theory. Okay, so in the simplest examples, this moduli space has one complex dimension, and at each point on that moduli space, you get a different gauge theory, which is generically QED-like, even though the theory is QCD-like at some points. Okay, by solve the theory, what I will mean is if we can tell you the precise masses and char charges of stable particles, at all points on the space of vacuum states, then I'll say we've solved it. That's my definition. That would be, an example of such a thing would be taking the strong interactions at high energy and being able to tell you ab initio that protons and neutrons and other particles like pions that also exist would emerge, okay, but with no input from experiment. Now it turns out that supersymmetry gives us a tool to do this. So in, for instance, QED, you can imagine two kinds of particles. There are the particles that you did learn about in high school that have electric charge, like the electron, like the proton. There are also particles that you didn't learn about in high school because they've only been seen once in an experiment and the experiment was never replicated. It happened on Valentine's Day of 1981 <laughs> or 82. Okay. Uh, and these are particles with magnetic charge, called magnetic monopoles. Why are they called magnetic monopoles? Well, the normal magnets that you play with have a north pole and a south pole, and the magnetic field lines go out of one and come into the other. And so there's no net magnetic charge. It's all flowing back into the magnet. A monopole would just have a north pole, one pole, mono, right? And the lines would just be going out, just like electric field lines from an electron. Now, I'm gonna start getting into some equations Relax, there'll mostly just be notation. At no point will calculus be involved. Okay. So if we call the complex parameter, 
that parameterizes our space of theories, this yellow plane, A, what supersymmetry buys us is there is a special function, um, not always in the technical sense, but often in the, even in the technical sense, there's a special function, F, that depends on A, which controls the particle masses. And in particular, if you have electric charge Ne, some integer, and magnetic charge Nm, some integer, in units of the basic charge, then those masses have to satisfy a bound determined entirely by this function f as you move around on that plane. That means stable particles in favorable circumstances will be those that saturate the bound because then nothing with those charges could be lighter. Okay? And so the problem that supersymmetry gives us is to determine this function and determine the values of the charges for which states saturating the bound can be found and they will then perforce be exactly stable and give you the low energy spectrum of your theory. Okay, they will be the analog of the neutrons and protons and pions in QCD. So to solve the theory by this lawyerly definition, we need to do a couple of things. <coughs> we need to determine this function f, which is called the prepotential by some people. And we need to determine the degeneracies of particles whose masses are controlled by this function f as a function of their possible charges. You pick a point on the yellow plane, you pick charges Ne and Nm, and you tell me how many particles are there. In an alternate world, maybe there could have been three different protons, each with slightly different properties. Okay. So these are both challenging problems. They have been subject to tremendously fruitful research in the last 25 years. And it's amazing that I'm trying to tell you about this in a colloquium, but I am, so you're going to have to bear with me. Okay, so what's the main challenge in determining this function? <coughs> Supersymmetry is supposed to make our life easy. It almost does. There's a classical answer. You just write down the theory and you do classical mechanics to it and you get the answer. Sometimes classical mechanics ain't perfect, but Feynman taught us that you can do these little wiggly diagrams called Feynman diagrams, which in 1949 were really state of the art, but now we have graduate students and they just do the Feynman diagrams. Okay, so there's a, a loop contribution that is a standard 1950s style physics computation. This modifies the function that you want. The answer to this computation depends on the parameter A. And then there's a third part, okay, which I'm going to put on the same footing as the first two, but it's not, uh, which is called instantons, which is a complicated word because this is a complicated thing. Okay, and you see that the physicist here is unhappy because she has to grapple with instantons. Okay, so what are instantons? They are configurations of the self-interacting gluon field of your QCD theory, this analog of the photon that self-interacts strongly and there could be one or two or three or four instanton configurations. They come with instanton number that's an integer. But determining their contributions is a counting problem of sorts and is outstandingly difficult. Okay. You'd like to know the number of one instantons, two instantons, and three instantons that contribute in your determination of this function. Now this problem was solved first in some example that satisfies all of my criteria, it has the QCD-like features, in seminal work of Cyborg and Winton 25 years ago. Those are their pictures, though more or less 25 years ago. They look different today. Um, we soon found, soon after their work, that string theory actually gives a striking way of solving such theories that does not require uh, such a high IQ. Okay. So if you just take a certain string compactification of the sort I've been describing to you, okay, something where the six extra dimensions are on one of these Calabi-Yau spaces, you try to solve the theory, just classically, function of its parameters. Well, certain string compactifications you know, involve degenerations of the extra dimensions where they become singular. So as you move around in the space of shapes and sizes of the calabi L space, maybe one of these holomorphic spheres we counted contracts to zero size. It turns out that at such points, such singular points, such calabi L spaces give rise in the four dimensions to a strongly interacting gauge theory of much the same class that we've been talking about here. And the string, the string model that makes this interpretation obvious is one where the gauge theory interpretation solving for the function f requires counting minimal area spheres in a calabi space. Okay, now this is a horrible problem. As I said, it's an enumerative algebraic geometry problem. Uh, it has a fine history, like I said, going back to the Greeks, but just like most of the Greeks, none of us know how to solve this problem. It's very hard to do. However, we have mirror symmetry. We have the symmetry between x and some other theory, 2b string theory on y. 
So you can take this horrible configuration, singular, that's supposed to be related to gauge theory by string theory magic. You can mirror symmetrize it, go to the dual picture, and just do a classical computation and compute this function. So that's the thing that was done, again, in part by people in the audience. Yeah, right. So this is the second counting problem that string theory has solved that's somewhat non-trivial. Okay, I have some time left, and I have one more problem I'm gonna talk about, but I'm gonna talk about it in the conclusion of my talk. So in this talk, what I've tried to do is describe a few examples where mathematically and physically interesting counting problems occur and can be solved in string theory. Okay, one was the problem of partitions, though the way it's solved doesn't really involve string techniques, it just ties to what the states of the string are. One involved a problem in enumerative algebraic geometry, in this case, counting curves inside some big manifold, some big space. A third problem, logically distinct, and certainly distinct in the communities motivated to solve it, involves solving uh, interacting gauge theories, like QCD. And here the problem reduced to counting instantons. And because of limitations of time and technical skill, uh, the only way I could solve this problem was by relating it to that problem, which was already solved. Now, throughout this talk, okay, spherical cows are more attractive, but the thing that really played a role was these Calabi outcome pactifications. Okay? And they played an important role as the analog of spherical cow models of string theory that we can try to solve. Okay, solving these is, in a real full sense is still beyond our strength, um, but they're sort of the right playground for us. Now, on the other hand, here's a fact about these. What I said is, uh, Yao proved that you can solve the Einstein equations uh, given one of these spaces and get a solution of string theory in a vacuum, something that has no sources of, of, of energy. But we don't actually know the solution of the Einstein equations. What that would mean is knowing a distance function with, which you could use to compute a force between two particles. We don't actually know that distance function or metric on any compact Calabi F space. Okay, Yao's proof is sophisticated and implicit. So now I'm gonna tell you about something very new uh, which therefore is also very untested, maybe it won't go anywhere, but we'll see. Um, by thinking about the way singular string compactifications give rise to gauge theories, which was the last section of my talk, you take a singular Calabi out, you get a gauge theory. Physicists actually discovered a new class of theories that are different from quantum field theory uh, in the 1990s. These are called little string theories by some people. The important point is that they're theories that are simpler than gravity, but, but they're, they're, they're somehow cousins of field theory. And it turns out that one of the simplest of these theories that you can engineer out of singular strings, when compactified on a product of circles, has a very interesting space of vacua. So the analog of this U-plane, the yellow plane that was my space of supersymmetric theories when I discussed gauge theories, is actually the simplest non-trivial compact Calabi L space, a K3 surface. So now you have a field theory or something like a field theory. You put it on a circle. And it produces, as its space of possible ground states, a Calabi -Yau manifold. If we can determine the functions that I was talking about in the previous part of my talk, the F and the numbers of these states with given electric and magnetic charges for this theory, we can use that counting and this function F to derive a formula for the Ricci flat metric on this K3 surface. So the one piece of this problem that Yao left undone actually telling us the metric we could start to do. And this is sort of a beautiful symmetry, because in the previous section of my talk, I used a calabi space to solve a gauge theory, and in this part of my talk, I'm claiming that you might be able to use something like a gauge theory to solve for the metric on a calabi space. Okay, this is how duality always works. Somehow, both sides play interesting and important roles. So this, again, builds heavily on work of people uh, in the audience. Now, turning this into a concrete and useful set of formulas as opposed to a word proof uh, is work in progress. And, okay, let me close. Here's string theory summarized. Uh, Greg mentioned at the start of the talk I've worked on string theory and its relation to cosmology, condensed matter physics, particle physics, in this case, I guess, mathematics. Okay, and part of that is in searching for the answer to this question. Okay, I just had an awesome idea. Suppose all matter and energy is made of tiny strings. Okay, what would that imply? I don't know. Okay, so the way string theorists proceed to attack this problem is they explore all possible fruitful connections and avenues. Often we're studying spherical cows, we're not studying the real problem, but we hope that understanding those spherical cows will either lead to entirely new fields, 
or at least teach us about soluble models of the problems that are still too hard for us to solve. So I hope this small set of connections I could discuss in this talk that just involved string theory, field theory, algebraic geometry, and some other math helped to sort of illustrate this richness and show how there's a sort of tight circle of ideas that interconnect and that lead to predictions that are certainly non-trivial, like they make Sheldon's thesis, you know, the work of a line. Um, but, but on the other hand, they haven't quite gotten us to where we'd like to be yet. Thanks for your uh, attention.